Some of you read Just Mercy, written by Brian Stevenson. In it, he tells an incredible story about meeting Rosa Parks for the first time. When he does, she turns to him and she sweetly asks, now Brian, tell me who you are and what you're doing. Yes, ma'am, he says. And he begins to tell her about the project of his lifetime, building the Equal Justice Initiative. He tells her that he's trying to help people on death row. He tells her actually he's trying to stop the death penalty. Actually, he's trying to address prison conditions across the country, and actually he's trying to free the wrongly convicted and trying to end unfair sentencing and trying to stop racial bias in the criminal justice system. Rosa Parks leans back smiling, and she says, ooh, honey, all of that is going to make you tired, tired, tired. <laughs> and then she leans forward, and she places a finger on his face and talks to her just the way his grandmother used to. And she says, and that's why you've got to be brave, brave, brave. Look, folks, we're not even Brian Stevenson, and we are tired, tired, tired. A Pew study that came out this summer said that seven out of 10 Americans are simply worn out from the influx of daily news. And I don't know who those other three Americans are, <laughs> really. Like, what are they doing? Because we rode the wave from shock to fury to frustration and bewilderment and back again, and that was just this weekend. <laughs> so the question that I want to ask us this morning is what can we do to prepare our hearts so that the blast of the shofar does not make us want to roll over and hit snooze, but instead wakes us and shakes us and fuels us for the chapter ahead? Over the past several years, there have been a number of historians who have been writing with a newfound urgency, trying to awaken us to patterns of political behavior and cultural shifts that in the 20th century marked a dangerous turn to fascism. Timothy Snyder, a Yale professor of history, writes about the Holocaust not only as history, but also as precedent, as warning, and he fears that its eternal lessons have not yet been learned. Snyder and others are warning us that vicious and corrupt and bloodthirsty regimes of the last century all operated under a similar playbook in which fatiguing and ultimately the numbing of decent people was an absolutely essential chapter. Some of you were here in the spring when Mika Almog, the granddaughter of Shimon Peres, came to Ikar. On that visit, she taught me a new Hebrew word, lehishtablel, to snail, lehishtablel. Snailing is when we are so tired and so numb, when the power seems so entrenched that all we want to do is curl up inside our shells where it's cozy and safe and comfortable and we can turn on the TV. The problem with snailing is that when we do hide inside our shell, we're likely to get stepped on without even having seen it coming. And we're also no good to anybody else. So today I want to share with you a story that some of you might know about a rabbi named Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai so detested the Roman occupiers of the land. He saw all of their innovations as a reflection of their crass materialism, their spiritual corruption, their innate evil. So he and his son, Rabbi Elazar, but Rabbi Shimon, flee into a cave where they sequester themselves from the world for 12 years. Even his wife does not know where they are. And in this cave, they bury themselves in the sand up to their necks bare naked so that their clothes don't wear out. And they study Torah all day long. They rise only to clothe themselves and pray three times a day, and then they quickly return into the sand. They are snailing. This is a pietistic dreamscape. They isolate themselves from the worries of the world, free of distraction. They are completely immersed in holiness. After 12 years pass, Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Elazar, his son, receive a prophecy that the emperor has died and it's time for them to leave their cave and return to the world. But when they emerge, 
They are outraged. They're outraged by the lack of piety and purity around them, and everything that they cast their eyes upon burns to the ground. Until the bat kol, the voice of God, shouts from the heavens, have you emerged from hiding only to destroy my world? Chizlu limaratchem. Go back to your cave. All of their devotion, all of their study, all their isolation failed to open their hearts to the world. Instead, that seclusion only made them feel bigger and better and more important and holier than everybody else. As our teacher, Rabbi Harold Schulweis, taught years ago, for 12 years, you lived in a cave of moral irresponsibility. What right do you have to judge this world, let alone burn the place down when you've done nothing to fight for it? I recently was giving an address to a group of young philanthropists, and I shared that the dominant question for Ikar has expanded over the years from what does our Jewish inheritance offer us toward a life of purpose and meaning? to what does our Jewish inheritance demand of us in a time of moral crisis. Several of the people in the room became agitated as I was speaking until one stood up and he literally said, I have no idea what you are talking about. What moral crisis? My kids are in private school. I have a gorgeous new house and look at my hot wife. And David said afterwards he was glad he was there because he would not have believed me <laughs> if I came home and told him that story. I am sure that that man does have a very good life, and I know that he's doing good with his money in the world. But I wonder, what has happened to the Jewish soul when all that matters is that we are fine? I often think about Archbishop Desmond Tutu's teaching on Ubuntu, which many of you know, a person is a person through other persons. He teaches us that in Africa, when someone asks, how are you? The reply is always in the plural, even when you're only speaking to one person. So a man would say, we are well, or we are not well. He himself may be quite well, but his grandmother is sick, so he's not so well. Ubuntu, it's the essence of being human. It speaks of the fact that my humanity is caught up in and inextricably bound up in your humanity. We are well, they say, or we are not well. Well, friends, we are not well. I mean, that guy seems to be fine. <laughs> but we are not well. We are not well when the moment we step out of our cave, we hear about a young mother who fled violence in El Salvador only to arrive at the US border to be given five minutes to say goodbye to her two small boys who were then ripped from her arms. We're not well when more than six weeks after the court mandated deadline for reuniting parents with their babies has passed and nearly 500 children still remain separated from their families by force of the US government acting out of wanton cruelty and gross incompetence. Did you see the video from the Houston airport? of the small, curly-haired boy who's squirming to escape his desperate mother's arms after reunification because he does not recognize her? She desperately cries out, Mi amor, I am your mommy. I am your mommy. What's wrong with my son? What's wrong with my son? We are not well when we confront the reality that even those who are reunited, the lucky ones, will still be traumatized for many years to come. We are not well when racist dog whistles today sound more like bullhorns, when black athletes are scorned and penalized for engaging in nonviolent protests against police violence, when this Justice Department actively works to roll back civil rights achievements of previous administrations, and a black candidate for governor is mocked in robocalls, calling him a monkey living in a mud hut when seven of nine polling places in poor and black neighborhoods in Georgia are threatened to be shuttered only months before the election, when in 23 out of 50 states in this country, there have been new, harsher voter suppression laws adopted only in the last decade alone, like the racist gerrymandering in North Carolina, which the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals said targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision. Yeah. 
It's a victory that only a dozen pathetic Nazis went to march in DC on the anniversary of Charlottesville. But they have moved from the streets to the ballots. There are a number of avowed white nationalists, Holocaust deniers, and Nazis now on the ballot in state and federal races this fall. And organizations that monitor hate groups say that it is clear that white nationalists are emboldened when the president himself advances their agenda every time he discharges insults against Muslims, against Mexicans, against African Americans. No, we are not well. We are not well when Callie Greer from Alabama, who I marched with in DC at the Poor People's Campaign, wails in agony as she describes her daughter Venus dying in her arms from a cancer that could have been treated could she have afforded health care. In her state of Alabama, the governor and the state legislature refused to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. And so Venus became one of 250,000 Americans to die from poverty-related illnesses in this, the US, the wealthiest country in the world, every single year. We are not well. We are not well when there are one to two shooting incidents in American schools every single week. When middle schoolers last week were reporting that they were afraid to return to their classrooms because they were scared they were going to get shot. When the Secretary of Education toys with the idea of allowing states to siphon federal funding that was intended for the arts and for music and for mental health and technology programs, instead to the purchase of guns for teachers, we are not well. We are not well when just in the course of my own lifetime, the prison population in this country has grown from 200,000 to 2.2 million people. We are not well when Puerto Rico is abandoned, when the highest court allows a perversion of democracy, allowing unlimited and unaccountable funds to corrupt our elections, when our planet aches under the weight of fossil fuels and the horror that they're wreaking on our environment and even still, our government obsessively and furiously prioritizes deregulation, we are not well. Yes, we are in a moral crisis. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to recede to our caves? Are we gonna hide up to our necks in sand? Bother only with our private schools and our beautiful homes and our hot wives? Are we gonna focus only on our own nourishment and our body and soul where the whole world burns outside? Or will we reject that model? Will we say to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son Rabbi Elazar and to all the other snails out there, know this, either you work to dismantle oppressive systems or your inaction becomes the mortar that sustains them. Keep your politics off the pulpit, they say. As if our Torah is not an inherently political document, as if the story of slaves rising up before the most powerful ruler of the ancient world, demanding freedom and dignity for all people, is not an inherently political message. Our Torah did not survive for thousands of years, only to be muted and made impotent precisely at the moment that its eternal message matters the most. We make a mockery of our tradition when we suggest that the way that we live in human society, the way that we treat one another, the way that we care for, and the way that we neglect the least among us is outside the scope of religion. As if Judaism is supposed to make us feel comfortable and complacent. As if I would dare to tell you who to vote for in November. You don't need me to do that for you. But maybe what you do need from me is to remind us that prayer and ritual and religion itself means nothing at all if it is not a response to the greatest, deepest moral crises and challenges of our day. Maybe all of this means nothing at all if it's not a reminder to us in tumultuous times that we are called to lead with love, to bring a commitment to equity and equality, to justice and dignity, to the forefront of every conversation, not only in our homes and in our classrooms and in our Jewish institutions, but in our society, which today is profoundly unwell. Rebuked by God, Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Elazar returned to the cave, 
One imagines with a mix of dread and relief because who really wants to be enmeshed in the world with all of its impurities and failings anyway? Another 12 months pass. Father and son are again buried up to their necks in sand, cloistered from the world, when the bat coal finally returns and calls them to emerge a second time. Se'u mimaratchem. Get up now and leave this cave. When they go, the son, Rabbi Elazar, again incinerates the world with his judgment and his indignation. But the father, Rabbi Shimon, has been transformed. He now is a healer, not a destroyer. And he realizes that it's not enough for him to put out his son's rageful fires. But instead, he says, since I have been the beneficiary of great miracles, let me go out now and bring some healing to our society, which is desperately in need. You remember the story of Noah and the ark. Noah was a righteous man. He was a tzaddik, we are told. But even a cursory read of this story shows us how deeply flawed Noah actually was. Because when God instructs him to build an ark because a flood is coming that will destroy all human civilization, every man, woman, child, and living being, with the exception of those who make it onto the ark, the Torah then offers the two most painful words of the entire scroll, Ken Asa. God asks, and Moses does, how many decks and where shall I place the window? No moral objection, no challenge. And Noah turns to his family and says, don't worry, my loves, we're going to be okay. We have this gorgeous home and private schools. And wow, Mrs. Noah, <laughs> you are looking really good. Come, friends, let us jump on the boat and save ourselves. <laughs> because of that, the rabbis teach that even Noah was, in fact, a tzaddik, a righteous guy. There really are two kinds of tzaddikim. One, like Noah, is a generally menchie guy, but when it's cold out, he puts on a warm coat. We call him a tzaddik in pelts. The other kind of tzaddik is one who, when it's cold, lights a fire, through which he warms not only himself, but others around him as well. We are not well, friends. And I'm sorry, but it is no longer enough to be the first kind of tzaddik who looks out for himself and his family and his sweet life. The times that we are living in demand more of us than that. So I'm sorry, but we don't have the luxury of snailing through this era. In the language of Abraham Joshua Heschel, who never could have imagined an American president equivocating on the, on the evil of Nazis on American soil. He said, this is the decision that we have to make. Whether our life is a pursuit of pleasure or an engagement for service, this is no time for neutrality. We Jews cannot remain aloof or indifferent. We too are either ministers of the sacred or slaves of evil. Or in the language of my friend, Reverend Michael Ray Matthews, each of us must choose. Will we be a chaplain to the empire or a prophet of the resistance? We are not well. We enter this new year today knowing that whatever else is going on in our lives, whatever grief and dreams and aspirations you hold, our country, this place that we call home, which is home to 325 million people, among them half of the world's Jewish population, a place that blessedly gave refuge to most of our ancestors who came here fleeing Cossacks and Nazis and poverty and discrimination and pogroms. That nation is now profoundly unwell. But this story is not over yet. A friend of mine who's an African-American Zen Buddhist priest named Angel Kyoto Williams declares that it is time to build a new America. In all of our talk about the grandeur of America and its exceptionalism, we often fail to acknowledge that America was not built for many of the people who now call it home. Let's be frank, it was not built for black and brown folks. It wasn't built for Muslims or for Asians or for Latinos or frankly for Jews. It wasn't built for LGBTQ folks. It wasn't built for feminists. It wasn't built for radical African-American Zen Buddhist priests, and it wasn't built for women rabbis either. It wasn't built for so many of us. 
We don't need to return to a time of mythic greatness. We need to build America anew. Yes, we are unwell, but we can and we must build a new America, and it's already happening. This year, we witnessed the beginning of a nonviolent revolution. A million students walked out of their classrooms across the country and took to the streets. This army was led by 16-year-olds who saw their friends shot while they hid under their desks and behind file cabinets, who texted their parents final words of goodbye while a gun-wielding murderer rampaged through their school with a weapon he should never, never been able to get his hands on. These kids saw the sickening inaction and hypocrisy and complacency of elected officials and they stood up and they insisted that they were going to bend the arc of history themselves if the grown-ups weren't going to do it for them. To be honest, many of us had essentially given up. We mocked the thoughts and prayers of legislators, but we did little more than think and pray on the travesty of gun violence in this country. After Sandy Hook, it was grief paired with a fierce determination. But six years later, after we witnessed the failure of Congress to free itself from the grip of the gun lobby, even for the sake of the little ones, each new shooting paired grief with despair. And we, Americans, the most empowered people on the planet, became convinced that there was simply nothing that we could do. We were living the tragedy of perceived powerlessness. We felt we were banging our heads against a brick wall, and we were getting tired, tired, tired of walking away bruised, but not these kids. This spring, we saw a new generation standing up and saying that they were no longer willing to risk their lives waiting for someone else to take action to stop the epidemic of mass shootings in America. And so Emma Gonzalez and David Hogg and Cameron Kasky and Mei Ling Ho Xing, these became the voices of moral leadership in America. Naomi Wadler, 11 years old, standing at the March for Our Lives, reminding the nation that gun violence disproportionately affects women and people of color. And she said, do you remember? My friends and I might still be 11, and we might still be in elementary school, but we know what is right and what is wrong. And we also know that we have only seven short years until we too have the right to vote you out of office. And my own Sammy, 11 years old, grabbed the bullhorn at a rally unprompted and shouted, help us understand how many kids need to die before our government decides to do something about it, enough is enough. These kids have seen their friends pay with their lives as elected officials actively thwarted progress on this issue over the years. And they are standing up to remind us that neutrality is never a moral category when human lives are on the line. I want to share with you something I found this summer that I love. Did you know that when we're reading from the Torah on Shabbos morning or on the holidays, and we see a smudge or a missing letter, you know what we're supposed to do? The rabbis teach that we are to summon a child, and we are to ask that child if she can read the letter or not. And if she can, we're allowed to continue. But if she can't, we have to retire that Sefer Torah until it's repaired. Think about that for a moment. A child who herself is not old enough to read from the Torah, that child is called to determine if our most sacred object is kosher or if it is pasul, not viable for use. A child. Why a child? Because a child's fidelity is only to the truth. He does not live in the pocket of corporate interests, so he doesn't care who he's offending. She does not say what she thinks will make people happy. She calls BS on hypocrisy of the grown-ups. And because she's a kid, she doesn't care about being polite and being measured. And our system, the halachic system, is wise enough to recognize that sometimes the grown-ups need to stand down and look at the situation through a child's eyes, to let the purity of their outrage and their imagination be the driving force, not only of their generation, but of the communal practice and even of the nation. Once a child renders judgment on a Sefer Torah, 
No matter how important the Torah reading is that day, we might be in the middle of a bar mitzvah, it might be Rosh Hashanah morning with 3,200 people waiting to hear the sacred words. When that child renders judgment, the adult community listens. If that child says pasul, the scroll is removed. Our children are in the streets and they are shouting pasul, pasul, it is not kosher what's happening in America today. This old America, the America of greed and corruption and hatred, of systems built to protect and sustain white supremacy, to entrench power in the hands of the few and keep guns in the hands of the many, this system that requires for its sustenance the suppression of the votes of hundreds of thousands or millions of black and poor people, this system is pasul, it is foul, and it's corrupted. And unlike us, the grown-ups, these kids won't even consider that change is impossible. It's their passion that's going to lead the way to a new America. It's their moral clarity, their fidelity to the truth, their chemical allergy to hypocrisy. They are leading, and all of us, we need to stand behind them now with the full force of our political and our spiritual and our intellectual and our material resources. Anything short of that would be a gross abdication of moral responsibility. Victoria Gonzalez's boyfriend, Joaquin Oliver, was a senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who was killed in the hallway on the third floor of his high school. I feel like my whole life was taken away from me in a moment, Victoria said. I feel him laughing when I laugh. I feel like he's living through me in a way. We loved like there was no tomorrow, until there was no tomorrow. On graduation day, when Joaquin's name was called, his mother walked across the stage to accept his diploma and a medal and a tasseled cap. And she wore a t-shirt that screamed in big black letters, this should be my son. The victims, families, and the survivors will hold this trauma for the rest of their lives but they will not allow us to let them hold it alone. Their bold, unapologetic assertion that America is profoundly unwell ought to shake us out of our exhaustion. There may be a time when it really is too late to redeem America. Thank God I do not believe that we are there yet. Every single day, is an opportunity for us to stand up and to refuse to capitulate, to refuse to hide in the sand and instead to insist that there is a better way. So yeah, we're tired, tired, tired. But in our story, the bot kol, the prophetic voice, is the voice of our children calling to us, si'u mimaratchem, get up now and leave your cave. This is no time for neutrality. This is no time for exhaustion. The new America will not come easily. We are gonna have to fight for it. And many people in this room are already on the front lines of this battle. We must continue to fight with love, with creativity and imagination and guts beyond what we think that we can muster, with resilience and heart. This is going to demand of us a kind of spiritual strength that we might not believe that we have, but I know that we do. We will rebuild this nation with love, and together we will become well. And that wellness will shine a new light of hope and possibility from sea to shining sea. There is a new America being born, and it is fierce and gorgeous and fair, and it's built on justice and mercy, and it makes room for everyone. And to usher in this new America into the world, we, every single one of us, will have to be brave, brave, brave. Shana tova metukah.